Hey guys, it's Matt and Jesse, and this is our CaroCon Quick Starter course. We're going to go through the main 10 lines that you need to know in the CaroCon, and these lines correspond to the chapters in our CaroCon Chess Goals opening course. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I've been playing this opening now for, I don't even know, maybe like a year or so, something like that. So I've really enjoyed it, and uh, it's going to be back recording. We've had a little break from recording, so let's get started, Matt. What we got? All right, so we're starting off with the most popular line. We see one e4. This happens in about half of the games at the club level, and even up at the GM level, it's about half of the games. But we're playing c6. This is the Karo Khan defense. d4, you're going to see this about half the time, so we're at about 25% of your games with the black pieces. And we're going to play d5. So what's the just overall theme of the Karo Khan with the pawn structure? Um, well, it kind of depends what white is going to go, but generally um, we're going to focus on a weak pawn. A lot of the times this D pawn is going to be weak, so you'll see like this advanced, we'll get into this in a little bit, and then we end up trading uh, the C pawn for the D pawn, and there's going to be like a backwards D pawn that we can attack. So normally out of the opening with the Karakon, we have something to attack, something to gang up against. Yeah, very well said. So our pawns are on the light squares. We're going to target white's pawns in a lot of these lines. So the most popular move is pawn to e5. This is called the advanced variation. And the e5 pawn gives white a space advantage. You can see all of this space in front of white's king. We're looking a little bit more cramped. And here we're recommending the second most common move, which when I used to play the Carol Khan as a kid, you rarely saw c5. That's our recommendation, but it's gaining a lot in popularity lately. Yeah, for sure. And it's a really challenging move because white just can't like continue developing normally like they want to. They have to like really address this. Like they really don't want us to take and then they take and then we get this free tempo on the queen. So it seems like there's something they got to do. So a lot of the times, you know, maybe they'll defend with the knights. There's a few moves we go over in the course, uh, but the most common move here is c3. Um, there's no reason for us to yet break the tension so we're going to develop with knight c6 a good one to remember is it looks like we're kind of just giving up a pawn but that does hang their e pawn and we would take that transition for sure um, so what happens after knight c6 matt so most players will play the natural looking move knight to f3 uh, bringing another defender on the pawn on d4 and at this point we want to capture c takes d4 and after c takes d4 back by white now we play bishop to g4, and you can already start to see this pressure that we're applying. The bishop pins the knight on f3, and the f3 knight was a defender of this pawn on d4. So we have one attacker here, there's two defenders, but we do have this pin, and we're looking to bring more attackers onto the d4 pawn very quickly. Yep, so it's only in like move six, and black is already kind of pressing. Like they really don't want us to allow this capture, and they couldn't take back with the queen because it hangs his piece, so they have to damage their structure. So we're like putting putting the focus on them. Like, how are you gonna go about defending this pawn? So bishop e2 makes sense. And we're gonna continue our development with e6. So it looks like we're getting ready to bring our bishop out, but really we're opening up the square for our knight. So we'll see that in the next couple moves. So I think in terms of imbalances, white still has the space, uh, but we have this weakness on d4. So we're going to try to play for the initiative and target that d pawn. Uh, so we see castling by white, and the position is about equal here. So even though we're going to talk up the black side and you know kind of look at the pros from our position, white is still right in the game. Okay, so now we're going to play knight to e7. And at this moment, you can kind of see our bishop and knight are fighting for squares to get developed. What we're going to do is we're going to start with the knight and bring him out to f5, and that will open up the e7 square for this bishop later. Yep, exactly right. And Matt said that the um, position is equal as far as the fish goes, and it is. Um, but I think it is a lot easier to play for black. Like, we have this pawn we're ganging up against, and we just have, like, very quick developing moves to really go after that pawn. So that's why I like the caro. It's like white kind of stumbles into this and doesn't realize that, oh, wait, I'm having to defend a backwards pawn this whole time. Um, so knight g7, white plays h3 here, and this is a very good opportunity just to snap this knight. Um, a key defender of this pawn, and we're taking, obviously, with tempo, white's going to have to take back. And we can attack this pawn in a couple ways. So knight f5 is a nice move here, but we have something even slightly more accurate, and that is queen b6. 
So yeah. So it's... why why Queen B6 here? Queen B6 is a nice move because not only are we double attacking this D pawn, Queen and Knight, our Queen also pressures the pawn on B2. So the way that White wants to defend the D pawn is to play Bishop to E3. So like if Knight F5, maybe they sneak in Bishop E3. It's not available now after Queen to B6. And White's H3 on move 9 was actually a mistake. And the reason we're covering it in this quick starter course is because we like to base our courses on games that happen at the club level. This mistake is super common. So I wanted to show this in one of our 10 most important lines to make sure that you can capitalize on how to win this D pawn. All right, so what's our yep. plan here after Queen B6? Uh, let's just win this pawn. There's really not a great way to defend both these pawns. In fact, I don't think there is a way to defend both these pawns. Um, so we're going to get something. We need to be a little concerned about the rook coming over and winning our pawn back. So there's a few things that we talk about in the course um, as far as navigating that. Um, once pawn is captured, mission complete, then we just get our pieces in. Bring the knight up, further the pressure here, develop the bishop, and we're probably going to castle after that. And that's something that we do in our main Khan opening course as well as every line, we leave you with a plan. So that's what we're doing here as well. All right, so let's move on to line number two, Jesse. And we're starting off with the same move order. And after C5, now we're going to look at D takes C5. And this is more common among, among titled players, but not quite as common at the club level. Yep, I don't see this move too often um, at my level. I'm about like 16, 15, 16, 1700 on chess.com. Um, and this was actually a move that we struggled with in our course a little bit. Um, struggled to find a recommendation against that, I should say. We thought about knight over, knight here, but we ended up going with a more simple um, approach to this, and that is e6, just attacking this pawn with our bishop. Um, so what is White's plan here? So usually what White tries to do is they hold on to these pawns as long as it makes sense strategically, and then at some point they want to give back a pawn in a way that's uncomfortable for us. So you'll see titled players here will play moves like a3, uh, but you don't see that a lot at the club level. So we're going to go over the most common club level move, bishop to e3, and White's just trying to hold on to the pawns as we attack them. All right, so now... How do we attack both of these pawns? Knight to d7. That's our recommendation. And here, the most common move is bishop to b5, winning the knight to our king, and still, white's trying to hold both of the pawns. So what do we do next? Yep, so after knight, uh, or sorry, after bishop b5, we can actually throw in a check. Um, the only sensible move here is to uh, block with the knight while defending the bishop. This this was was a fork. And um, after they block and defend, nice find by white, um, we have a6 just to kind of force the issue a little bit. So once this bishop captures, we'll have another attacker on uh, the c-pawn. And if they decide they don't want to capture and they move away, then we can just, you know, take the pawn as we will. So they're very likely going to capture. We'll capture back. And uh, what do we, where do we go from here? So at this point, white is still up the pawn, but we have the bishop pair advantage. We have two bishops to one, but the downside of the bishops in the current position is white still has all of their pawns on the board and we still have seven pawns. So the more pawns you have on the board, the less valuable the bishops are compared to the knights. So that's something we want to think about going forward and we chip away at white's pawns. So here are the most common move for white. It's pawn to a3. And you want to be careful here you immediately try to take this pawn on c5, there's pawn to b4, forking bishop and queen. So our recommendation is drop the queen back. This is a really common idea. If the queen's on a5 and you see a3, bring her back to c7 because now she pressures both of white's weak pawns and pretty soon we're going to win back the pawn. So pawn to b4 by white. And now this is a slight mistake, but it's the most common club level move, pawn to b4. How do we punish this? Yep. So we could go ahead and take this pawn, but we actually have a little better. We have b6. So this is a nice, a very nice structure for white. Um, this c pawn is on the verge of becoming very dangerous. Like if we instead played b5 here, this would be a protected past, past pawn. Um, and what's important about this move is when white played the move b4, 
they actually undefended their knight. So their knight is hanging right now, so they don't have this chance to take because it just drops the knight. So we get this very nice b6 move in to completely undermine the structure, and we're going to be winning our pawn back and have a better resulting pawn structure at the end of it. Yeah, I think you'll have really good results in these positions when black makes these minor mistakes like pawn to b4. And our plan going forward, once things settle on the queen side, again, we want to reroute the knight out first, this time to g6, where he pressures the pawn on e5, bring the bishop out, castle, and then probably look to play f6, which is a way to bring that e7 bishop, the dark square bishop, into the game, and you can utilize your bishop pair. But this is something where I think you're going to win as black much more often than white's going to win this position. Yep, and you're almost always going to be up on the clock here because this is all so in our territory. This is like a, a textbook line from our course. Like we're going to get these positions a lot. Yeah, and it's we tr we do try to find similar plans and ideas across the chapters. So we just saw chapter one and chapter two have some very similar ideas with the pawn structure and the plans. All right, now we're yeah. getting into something a little more say, exciting. Yeah, I was going to say, keep that F6 move in mind, because that comes up a lot in uh, further chapters. Yeah. Now we're getting into something a little bit more exciting. E takes D5. This is the second most popular move. C takes D5. And let's take a moment here to compare this position to the French exchange. The French defense, white or black starts with the E pawn. And if the trade happens, then this E pawn is actually sitting on C7 and everything is completely symmetric. So some people think like, oh, this position is really dry out of the Karo. It's not a French exchange. This is a Karo exchange at the, at the current position. There's actually a lot of fight in the position. So there's two common ways that white can play this. Either they play C4, and that's going to be this line, that's the Panov attack, or they play it a little quieter and put the pawn on C3. That'll be the next chapter, the exchange variation. All right, so on to C4. Uh, yeah, so this is a, I think probably like the most principled way to play is to like uh, bite back in the center. But let's uh, keep in mind this D pawn is now backwards. <laughs> there has no defenders, so it can be a little weak. Um, we're going to start our development with knight f6. And the thing I like a lot about this chapter is that the lines are so consistent with one another that uh, the whole chapter just like flows together really well. And I think we'll highlight some of those here. So after knight c3, just kind of furthering pressure on here, we're going to bring out our other knight, knight c6. It's like starting to eye up this pawn. And then knight f3. Anything else to say about these first few developing moves? Mainly that we just want to bring those knights out quickly to the center, be able to attack the central squares. But I think this is the most fun move of the chapter. On to a6. It's a rare move, but it scores really well at the club level. And the more I dove into this move, the more I liked it. So I used to play pawn to g6 in these positions against the Panov, but now I solely play pawn to a6. And we call this our chess goals wrinkle. We look for rare moves that have a little bit of spiciness to them and that can get the game into our court where we're just more comfortable than the opponents. The idea here is this a6 move blocks a lot of the plans along this diagonal for white. So oftentimes you'll see that bishop or queen flying out to this diagonal, trying to attack our king. A6 kills a lot of the common plans. So very often I play this in blitz, and all of a sudden my opponent goes into like a 30-second think, and it's a 3-0 game because they have no clue what to do after A6. Yeah, and I like too how it's a bit of a waiting move and we don't have to commit our bishop. So we want to strategically place our bishop somewhere along this diagonal, and we're not entirely sure where we want it quite yet. So it does offer that little bit of waiting. That, that's a really good point. So most players are going to take. C takes D5. And when white doesn't take, a lot of times we'll put the bishop on E6 and force that C pawn to do something. So here we take back. Bishop to C4, most common move, creating a double attack. Also eyeing this F7 pawn. Uh, so now we have to respond, and we're going to actually play bishop to e6 here as well. So it is nice that we waited with the a6 move before figuring out where to put him. Yep, and we'll see this move come up quite a bit in the chapter, especially when we're um, just like over defending the d5 pawn. Um, so bishop e6, it looks kind of awkward because you're blocking in this bishop, uh, the dark square bishop, but very often we're going to Fianchetto in these lines anyway. Um, so bishop b3. And we have knight a5 here. 
a very annoying move. She's like, no, I insist. Like, we're, we are going to go after the bishop. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to grab the bishop pair, and we're also eyeing the c4 square. And that bishop pretty much had to drop back because we were threatening knight takes c3, hitting the queen and hitting the loose bishop. So there were some tactics in the air for us, too. All right. So bishop to c2 for white. Let me throw out a stat here. First time with a quick starter course. <laughs> I love the opening stats. If you didn't know. White is winning 30% compared to black 63% in the club database after this next move on to G6. And Jesse already mentioned it. What's the idea here with G6? Uh, yeah, so we have this uh, weak, you know, deep on. It's isolated, has no friends. So let's just ratchet up the pressure on it by putting our bishop on this good diagonal. So our plan is bishop G7, full castle, put our rook on C8. And the squares we would like to control are d5 and c4. So keep control of those light squares. And a lot of times when one side has the isolated pawn, the isolated d pawn, like we see here on d4, if there's a kingside fiend kettle for the opponent, it's very difficult for the IQP side, the isolated queen pawn side, to create an attack against the king. Because we actually block out the important bishop on this diagonal, hitting h7. So something to keep in mind here. I really like the position for black. Um, I've had good results in this line as well. And if you're thinking about this from White's perspective, this is a pretty bad isolated queen pawn position because this square is very well blockaded and we have a lot of pressure on this pawn. So a lot of this like dynamic play with a isolated pawn comes from like maybe a sacrifice or like ad advancing it down the board in an inopportune way. Mm -hmm. And there's not like a clear way to do that, you know, right now. There's going to take a lot of maneuvering before that can be possible. And sometimes in these lines, we even take on c3, switch it to what's called a hanging pawn structure. And with the rook on c8 and our control of these light squares, that's a, a nice pawn structure for us to work with as well. All right, here we go with line number four. So now we are going through the trade on d5 in a quieter move by white, bishop to d3. Uh, yep, and if we are very... Uh, keen and aware of like just a few moves into the game this d pawn is undefended from uh, for white so we can immediately put some pressure on it and it would surprise you how often it just goes here here castles and they just lose the pawn i've had that happen several times in my games and uh, that is a line in the course that we go over um, but that's kind of a cop out for a for a starter course because that's just a blunder. So we'll we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They defend the pawn. After c3, I like this move a lot. Queen c7. Um, it takes away this very good square for the bishop. Is that the main reason for queen c7? Yeah, that's exactly right. There's no good square for the f4 bishop, and the most common move for white is knight e2. Sometimes you'll see knight f3 uh, more often at lower levels. The idea with knight to e2 is white wants to force the action with bishop to f4. So we're not going to play a dry Karo Khan line, just go for the minority attack. We're going to fight in the center and try to grab a lot of space. And I think there's more chances for white to go wrong in this line. We're going to play bishop g4, pinning this knight on e2, so making it more difficult to play bishop f4 by white. And now the most common move is pawn to f3. What's the downside of this, putting the pawn on f3? Uh, well, it does uh, kind of loosen up their dark squares around the king, and it's also very likely that they're going to be castling king side. So it is a bit of a weakening move. So uh, we played here. We provoked a weakness. I think we said, okay, job well done. Let's just go back. <laughs> yep. Just poked at him and then walked away. <laughs> yep. And so uh, white is going to continue with bishop f4 here, but we have a nice counter strike here. So uh, we can toss in e5, and it's just kind of embarrassing when you put your bishop there and it immediately gets hit by a pawn. And the stats here in the club database, black wins 59%, the white's 34%. And I will admit, this move took me a little bit of time to get comfortable with. You have to play it a bunch because we are accept accepting an isolated queen pawn. And our king is stuck in the center for a few moves with the knight and bishop still on the home row. But as you get experience with this, I think you'll start to appreciate the dynamic play. So d takes e5. Almost everyone is going to capture that pawn. We take back with the knight. And notice how our f8 bishop is ready to go to either d6 or c5. And from those squares, it points across at the white king. So we're starting to target the weaknesses that Jesse highlighted 
because white played this pawn up to f3. Yeah, and uh, this pin right here looks kind of uncomfortable, but it's not too bad. We can, you know, in this exact position, we can always snap this bishop with check. Um, and then we're very often going to break this pin with the bishop out. And also there's no real way to kind of get at our queen or add another attacker to the knight. So we're good for now on this awkward looking pin. There's not really any way to ratchet up pressure on that. Okay, so after knight takes e5, white will likely castle, and we go bishop d6. What is the plan from here? So the plan is we're going to play the knight to f6, get castled quickly before there's any danger on the e-file. It's sort of a just-in-time situation. We're able to get out of danger with a move or two to spare. And then we would like to play knight to h5. So that f6 knight goes out to h5, kicks this bishop, and that's where we really see the power of the queen bishop battery on the diagonal. So this is one where if white's not careful, it could very easily lead to a crushing kingside attack. And I've had a couple of them just in the past year against players over 2,000. Like I've had really good results over the board specifically with these lines. Nice. Yeah, and I just want to like start moving these pawns up. <laughs> it's yeah. just like really poking at the king. So Carol Khan exchange should be a boring variation, but... We actually have some good attacking chances here. Yeah, I think the Karo Khan exchange chapters are some of my favorite in the whole course. What about this uh, coming up? We got the Tardikauer. Tardikauer is up there. It's up there for <laughs> sure. So now we're looking at knight to c3. This is sometimes called the classical variation. Uh, used to be more common than the advance. Then we're going to recommend d takes e4. Knight takes e4. And at this point, the most popular moves historically were bishop to f5 and knight to d7. Those were called the classical and the modern variations. We're recommending the third most common move, but it's gaining in popularity now. It's called the Tardikauer variation. And we're actually allowing white to double our f pawns. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, so whenever I play this, I like smile because people think they're just getting free doubled f pawns. Like, what are they doing? Opening up their king. Um, capturing back with the e pawn though does free up our bishop and this pawn structure is actually very solid and it's hard to break and we can actually use the extra f pawn to like provoke weaknesses in the white's camp so we cover this quite a bit because it's kind of like a controversial thing to just give up you know doubled f pawns but we cover it very thoroughly in the course and we can use these pawns as a huge advantage so i wouldn't play this blindly but it has a lot of punch to it, and I like these lines a lot. And we do engine check all of our lines in the courses. Knight to f6 is the top stockfish move. So modern engines really do like the Tardikauer as well. So most players are going to take knight takes f6. We do cover the retreat in its own chapter. E takes f6. G takes f is a move as well, but this is our recommendation. So white has this extra d pawn. We have the extra double pawns, but if you look at the material on the board, only one knight and one pawn are gone for each side, and there's no easy ways to simplify the pawn structure for white. White can't easily get trades with the pawns, so that gives us a lot of attacking chances with these bishops wide open on their diagonals. Yeah, and it's just going to take a long time for us to have a weakness here. This pawn structure is so incredibly solid. So now let's look at knight to f3 by white, most common move, natural development. And what I really like about this chapter, Jesse, is the next three or four moves are almost autopilot. We always play knight f6, we take with the e pawn, bishop d6, and after bishop d3, we castle. We always put our rook on e8, and then our plan is to route this knight over to the king side. And we're going to start to see all of the black forces start to move towards the white king. and create a surprising king side attack in a few moves. Yeah, I like that this knight comes like all the way over and like even in some cases like all the way to h4 and it's like really threatening. It comes like all the way across the entire board. Um, so it'll be fun over these next few moves to see all of our pieces migrating and just pointing right at the king. So uh, rook e8, um, h3. This is a, a nice move. It looks kind of like a wasted move, but this is actually a very desirable um, square for our bishop. So h3 makes sense here to prevent that. Um, knight d3 instead. c3 just kind of shoring up the center. Knight f8. So this uh, typical maneuver. 
This is very common in a lot of the lines in this chapter. Um, anything else to talk about for these moves? No, I don't think so. Our plan is we're going to play bishop e6, queen d7. And I had to show this line because this sacrifice happens all the time. Queen c2 by white. Let's play a few moves deeper. So even though this is our quick start course, we have to show this idea because it's just so nice and it's really common in practice. We're going to recommend bishop to e6. Bishop to d2 by white getting developed. Queen d7. Now you can see the queen and bishop lining up with this h3 pawn. The line I'm showing in this chapter is rook a to e1. And here you could sacrifice the bishop immediately, but we're first recommending knight to g6. It makes it a little bit stronger. c4. Go ahead, Jesse. Do the honors. It's over. Is, is white just completely winning here? Yeah, we are clearly blocking. better. And so white actually cannot safely take back on h3. And we go into this in more depth than the course. But we've had multiple chess goals members already share their games. Jesse has a couple famous ones himself. Yeah. Just sack, sack, mate on the h3 square. Yeah, so the main idea is this, this, and if we get another move, um, knight h4 here, they can't take because this is checkmate, and they can't let us take. And so they have to un unwind this somehow. And it's really hard. I don't even know if they can. Yeah, I think usually the only way white survives this is if they can get their bishop to f1, or if their queen's on d1 helping to defend the knight. This is kind of the worst setup to try to defend against the attack. Yep. All right, let's move on to line number six. So here we have the classical variation again. Knight f6 takes, takes, c3. Bishop d3 in this case. So we're going to do the same move order. We're going to castle first. Rook e8, knight d7, knight f8, same idea. But now we're going to look at what happens if white doesn't go for the quick kingside castle and plays queen to c2 first. Um, yeah, so you can see them lining up against our h7 pawn. In the last uh, line, we had our knight already on f8, and so it was defending that pawn. So let's see how we can uh, kind of parry this, this mini little attack here. So rook e8, I like this move because we get our rook to where it needs to go. And white is still threatening this uh, h7 pawn. So we could play g6, um, but I like the move h5 here. It is quite likely that white's going to go kingside. And if they do, then we just keep pushing. And uh, this is just like a nice... Just a nice move. I like h5. Saves the pawn and gains a little space. This was another one that took a bit of practice for me to get comfortable with because it, it looks scary. Why are we pushing that pawn in front of our king? But like Jesse said, we're ready to attack with it. Um, and it slows down white's attack when they go queenside. So now let's say bishop to e3 by white. Very flexible move, preparing to castle either direction. And we're going to recommend knight to d7 here. And the plan is the knight will head to f8. And from that point, he'll most likely go to e6, because now we don't have the h-pawn to guard g6, and we see queen and bishop attacking. So knight f8, knight to e6. And at this point, white will most likely castle queenside, I think, if they waited this long. And the chances of a draw are very low in these lines, because we're going to have opposite side, opposite flank attacks. And I think once you get used to these structures, you're going to have pretty good chances, because white's most likely not facing the tartar that often and yeah i think we're just avoiding the the dry drawish carol lines in this chapter yeah just look at this position there's nothing dry about it <laughs> like tons of pieces tons of imbalances we got an h bond running uh opposite side cast castling perhaps uh yeah i like like this one a lot too so now we're going to look at the same line, but after knight f6, we're looking at the decline Tartikauer. So white is not capturing on f6. This is somewhat common at the club level, but very rare at the master level that they retreat the knight like this. Yeah, there are a lot of things you need to look out for with white if you're going to do this retreat. There, we have like four or five very common lines in our course, and they're just dead loss. Like we're just winning a piece or more. And so whenever I see this retreat, I'm like, okay, we got to get one of these lines. I guess it's got to be something good. 
Um, so we're going to start with h5 and just try to kick this knight away. <laughs> just that simple. h5, h4. That's the plan. And pretty much no matter what white does here, we push the h pawn unless they play h4. Yeah. So I want to show one of those lines that Jesse talked about. Since we're doing a 10 course quick starter here, I want to show you a common trap that we've seen in multiple games from Chess Goals members already. On to h4, picking the knight. Knight back to e2. That's the only move for the knight. That was the only safe square. And now pawn to h3. And we're opening up the light squares in white's position after white plays pawn to g3. Yep, so after pawn g3, we can apply immediate pressure, bishop g4. So this knight is undefended right now. And actually, uh, white cannot defend it with the move they want to play. And so they're going to have to move this knight out of the way. Knight f4. What is the move here, Matt? On to e5. I've gotten this wrong in chessable, I will admit, when I've trained <laughs> this course. On to e5, though. What a cool move. It looks like we're just sacking a pawn. White has knight, it... pawn both attacking it. Well, the knight's obviously pinned. And what's wrong with pawn takes pawn? It's over, baby. We take here. Take. Take with check. We're winning a piece and a rook. I mean, they'll get a piece back, but it is all over. And um, the other, the only other way to defend is, you know, queen defending this, uh, uh, I guess, pinning this pawn. But we can just push. And this knight's the goner. Yeah. So in this line, we're not letting it go to the judges' scorecards. We're going for the knockout. <laughs> going for the knockout. That's right. <laughs> All right. Line number eight. That's a fun one. It's like kind of like a trap, but... There's like four or five lines that white just plays right into that are so trappy. They're fun. To, they're fun to play. You got to be very careful if you're going to retreat your knight like that. Yeah, there's that other line where the bishop gets kicked back to b3, and we have our bishop cutting across the diagonal, and their rook is loose. It's kind of wild. Yeah, yeah, and we play this uh, play pay the play the breaks or like <laughs> threatening to trap the bishop. Lots of good stuff, you guys. Have, you yeah, guys have to explore huge it. teaser. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so d takes e, knight takes. Oh, speaking of that, Jesse. Oh, is that what we're going over? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're in the Tardic Hour declined again. Bishop to c4. Uh, we've seen this multiple times in Chess Goals members' games. On to h4, kicking the knight. Knight retreats. Seems like a logical square trying to allow the king to castle still. On to h3, and here we go again. Keep pushing. Keep we pushing. Weakening the light squares. Yeah. Um, so G3, and you got to look out. You got to look out. These white light scores are coming. I didn't know this uh, line was in the preview. I forgot <laughs> this to. Is, <laughs> this is great. So B5, Bishop B3. We were just talking about this. Bishop back, and we can actually play C5. And is it lost at this point? I think it's close because there's there's two issues. We're either trapping the bishop or we're playing bishop to B7 and immediately winning the rook. Peek at the eval. Uh, it says about 1.5 for black so far. <laughs> okay. So I guess bl white can play f3 there, uh, but then their knight is kind of blocked in. But c4, c3, I think, are the main moves still. Yeah. And yeah, f3 is the move here, but this is, this is already ugly. So negative like 1.5 we saw. Yeah. And then what's our plan in this position after f3? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> just develop because uh, white is not looking pretty right now. I think we just develop um, castle and play the position. Yeah. I think c4, knight c6, e5, and we should be in really good shape with that one and a half or, or larger advantage. All right, line number nine. Now we're looking at e4, c6, knight to c3. So there are some transpositions here when you see knight to f3 on move 2 or knight to c3 on move 2. Usually it goes to a, what's called the two knights attack, and that's what we're going to look at in this line. Occasionally, it can transpose if white throws in d4, one of the other chapters. So knight to f3 is, you know, keeping in the two knights attack territory. And to keep things consistent with our other chapters, like the Tardikawa chapter, we're going to recommend d takes e4. And after knight takes e4, Knight to f6. So same idea as Tardikauer, right? Yep. And there's a lot of similarities if they decide to take. 
Um, it's like a direct transposition position after they play. So we'll look at something else, queen e2. Um, we can take the knight. They'll take back. And the reason this is nice is because we can uh, maneuver the knight over with tempo uh, once it lands on f6. Knight d7, bishop c4, knight f6, uh, attacking the queen, and um, white hangs their queen. Right. Be very careful here. <laughs> bishop takes f7 is checkmate. You may fall for that in blitz when you're new to the course. So keep that in mind in this specific line. <laughs> so after knight e5, we want to play e6. We block the bishop and we renew the threat of capturing the queen. It does look a little strange. Our c8 bishop is blocked by the pawn on e6. And it's kind of locked in by these other light square pawns. But we're going to unwind this position very quickly. White drops the queen back to avoid the knight. Now we play pawn to b5. And the strongest move is a little pawn sacrifice. And if white takes on c6, we cover that in the course. But the most common move is bishop to b3. We're going to play queen to c7. And the position is close to equal. White does have the space advantage. And our plan is going to be bishop to d6, bishop to b7, get our king castled. And then we're going to look for either a6 and c5 or a5 and a4. So it's a lot of queenside play with the pawns, and we want to point the bishops over it towards white's king. Yep, and uh, the lines where they take the pawn are really fun too. That, that'll be fun to explore. Um, but yeah, once we get these bishops in the game, uh, we even like develop with tempo here against the knight. Uh, you can really see our the position open up. Yeah, and we'll start pushing these pawns up, and that's just a nice attack that we get. And we have a nice instructive game in the Carol Khan middle games course. Uh, it's game two in chapter seven in that course, if you do want to check it out. All right, one line left. This is chapter 10, and this is a really common one online. Back when I used to play the Caro as a kid, I never saw F3 here. But I think, you know, YouTubers and just the fashion trends of openings, a lot of players play F3 now. Yeah, when I was first learning this even a year ago, I saw maybe like a couple games with F3 here, but now I've seen it quite a bit over the last like couple months. I even had this in an over the board game. Um, so uh, definitely one good ones to look at. So the main idea that we're going to go with here is queen b6. The I guess the drawback of playing F3 is that these dark squares are a little tender. So if given the opportunity, we like to double up on this diagonal, maybe check, but we'll kind of go through some of those lines here. Yeah, and, and what White wants you to do with F3 is they would love for you to take and then take back with the F pawn. He would build a huge center. Yeah, that's why it's called the fantasy variation. It's like that was just the fantasy to have the two, the huge center. Um, we're not going to play into that, though. I think even taking right away, it's like already plus one, like over plus one for White. Queen to b6 is the sixth most common move. So this should really throw off your opponent in a position that's very sharp right off the get-go. So knight to c3, natural development. Now we take on e4, and I'll show you why. After f takes e4, we're going to immediately strike in the center, attacking these dark squares. We want to open up this diagonal, bring our bishop out. So we're playing e5 right away after the trade. Yep, and it's not super obvious to White that if they take here that it just really opens up this these dark squares, but this can be a, a brutal attack. So after e5, um, we'll give White the benefit of the doubt and not give up the dark squares. Um, so um, development for White. And now we take the d-pawn. E takes d4. Yeah, and so... uh, do we look at knight takes in the course or only queen takes? Um, they're almost identical in popularity. I think we do have a line on knight takes. Uh, but here we're looking at queen takes d4. And at this point, we're doing something that we don't recommend easily. We're offering, we're suggesting a queen trade. And I'm going to ask you, Jesse, because I ask you all the time in the course, what do we say about queen trades in our Karocon course? Uh, well, actually, in all of our courses, we never go for a queen trade unless we feel like there's enough Play that we can like justify playing for a win. So we're no, no, we're never playing for a draw in any of our courses and any of our lines. Here, there is enough to play for. So uh, the queen trade is actually kind of good. So you can see we're going to develop with tempo. We're going to uh, get some 
uh, gain some space and develop very rapidly. And one of the things that I like in this position is we do have that isolated e pawn to play against. So White's mm -hmm. king is open, and we have the isolated e pawn. Yep. Knight to b3. Here we're going to recommend bishop to d6. I like this move because there's some flexibility here. Either that bishop could retreat safely back to c7, or it may go to e5 later and get on this diagonal to pressure White's position. So now bishop to e3 by White, getting ready to maybe queenside castle. And our recommendation is knight to f6, pressuring this pawn. The position is about equal. And what's our plan in the next few moves? Uh, yeah, well, we want to castle. We want to develop our pieces, maybe knight d7, bring it up to e5 and kind of blockade that square, and then get the bishop in the game, and maybe tuck this bishop back just to make sure it can't get attacked. Yep, and white has the weakest pawn on the board, so that's something to keep in mind. Always think. Can I put a lot of pressure on that pawn, even if you're not going to win it? Maybe white will have to put all their forces to defending it, and you can attack something else at the same time. Yep. All right, well, that was pretty quick. That was a 10-line chess goals, Carol Khan, quick start. And our main Carol Khan course has about 90 lines, but it's also a lifetime repertoire, so we've slowly added some recommendations, like the hillbilly attack has been added. Uh, I just recently put a video on YouTube where there was like a knight f3, d3 line by white, and I put an official chess goals recommendation. So hope you guys enjoyed this course. Do you have any last words, Jesse, for the Carol Khan quick starter? Yeah, I was going to say like uh, the quick starter is just the tip of the iceberg for all of our Carol Khan stuff. So we have the full course, of course. Um, and then we also have a ton of YouTube content on like maybe you see a weird f4 move right away. Like we cover some of those lines. And then if you want to dig deeper, we have Caro Khan uh, Middle Games, which goes super in-depth on, I think, what, 30 games, something like that, maybe 40 games. 40 games, and, I believe. Yeah. And then on top of that, we have common uh, Caro Khan tactics. So it's not like winning a piece, but it's, uh, in every tactic, it's like, how do we punish this pawn? How do we, you know, ratchet up pressure against this backward pawn? So um, if you're looking to take an opening very seriously we have a lot of resources uh just for the uh the opening course and a ton of free stuff on youtube too and the youtube com content is organized in playlists by those same chapters um and yeah we add things as we go we always answer questions so you can ask questions right within our carol con course and other students can read the same questions and provide feedback that way as well all right thank you for watching everybody hope you enjoyed this have a good rest of your day. See you, Jesse. See ya.